Hey everyone, welcome to our second part of our Dan and Joe Sports Show tonight. As always, I'm Dan. Yeah, I'm Joe. Uh, Joe, when we left off, uh, we were going to talk about USC and Caleb Williams. Of course, uh, Utah just beat USC for, I believe, the fourth time in a row. A uh, dramatic game, kind of like the first one last year where I think Utah had to go for two to beat them. This time they made a last-second field goal without Cam Rising to get the W over USC. And, of course, at the end of the game, you'd show the jubilation of Utah, and they'd switch back over, and they'd show Caleb Williams. And, of course, that was the screenshots he saw over and over again. And one of the most ridiculous things that came out of this game was Emmanuel Acho, who was on ESPN, I think now he's with Fox, said, and I, he did this for clickbait purposes, but still I found it to be an atrocious and a reprehensible statement that Caleb Williams should sit out the rest of the season now and focus on the draft because his team can't win the national championship. And to me, in a year where he's had two, you know, not so great games in a row where you have all kinds of really other talented quarterbacks, Drake May, Riley Leonard, Jaden Daniels, uh, you know, go down the list, uh, Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., for him to do that, to, to sit out the rest of the season, would really rub me the wrong way if I was an NFL GM. And you pair it with all the other things where Caleb Williams seems really cocky. I mean, he basically put himself up as a free agent in college. He writes, you know, dirty messages on his fingernails and then gets, then gets just his, his – uh, then just gets wasted by that team that he wrote those messages about, that being Utah. I, I mean, I think that now's the time that he needs to stand up more than ever – and show that he's a dog and that he wants to fight. Yeah, I think that it would be very disappointing if he were to set out. I'm afraid it would really start a precedent where you could see a lot of players at other positions, too, that if they know they're going to be a first-round pick, they might even set out the season. And so very concerning for me. And, you know, I'm with you. You know, there are other quarterbacks in this class that are really good. And personally, I like a lot of these other guys maybe even better as far as pro potential. I told you, Last week, I think Jaden Daniels is my number one as far as who I think could project as the best NFL quarterback of this class um, for all the intangible purposes, too, in addition to the talent. And so this is definitely, you know, a factor that I would, you know, not like if I'm a team evaluating Caleb, Caleb Williams. And finally, you know, to your original point, I'm very uh, disappointed that anybody would encourage him to do this. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, I guess I would understand if he did that. It's another thing to say, this is what you should do. And that's what Emmanuel Acho said. I mean, he said specifically he should sit out the rest of the season. And like I said, I just I just find that to be a terrible precedent, uh, being a bad sportsman, being a bad teammate. And if it's important for you to be a good teammate in any position in football, it's quarterback and middle linebacker. Those are the leaders of both their sides of the field. And if you're going to quit on my team, then I don't want you in the NFL. Would you imagine, too? how much this is going to – could potentially water down some of the regular season games in, you know, October and November and early December, you know, if uh, teams – if quarterbacks start doing this. I mean, th th this could really take away a lot of the, the viewership from the rivalry games. Yeah, it really could. I mean, it, w it would be a huge shame to see that happen, and I really hope it doesn't. I mean, you know, hey, if, if uh, Jaden Daniels could have had the same attitude – when LSU dropped their second game against Ole Miss, if that's what's being put out there right now. Yeah, yeah, and he did. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, if you're an NFL GM, I mean, you look for things like this, and, you know, you look at the, the quarterbacks that are best in the NFL, you know, a lot of times not the one that was number one in college. And so, again, I would I, I think Caleb Williams has all the, you know, talent to be oh, a sorry. great quarterback. But I, I don't – but I do, you know, wonder about – you know, everything else that's going to come with it. Well, I mean, you know, you, you look at it, the guys that tend to have these kind of character flaws that show out in college don't tend to do very well at quarterback in the NFL. Um, you know, James Winston didn't have as long of a good career as we thought he would in the NFL. Baker Mayfield has been kind of up and down. I, I think that he was a lot better than Browns fans gave him credit for, but he's been relegated a little bit in the NFL, and now he's doing a little bit better. Um but, you know, like Lamar Jackson did good, but it took him a little bit to get there. Um, but I don't you – know, these guys that tend to have, uh, you know, these kind of uh, me-first attitudes don't tend to really do that good in the NFL at quarterback. 
I mean, you had, you know, Patrick. Josh Jones. Rosen, that's a great example right there of someone that kind of had oh, this yeah. mentality a little bit. And, I mean, one of the most talented quarterbacks I've ever seen in college, but couldn't really get it done in the NFL. Exactly, exactly. You know, you had questions about, you know, the intangibles and his character in discipline. And what I was going to say, too, with Patrick Mahomes, like, he went, what, like, six and seven his last year, like, played every game, was still putting up, like, 700 yards sometimes in a losing effort. I mean, you know, that said a lot about him, you know, projecting for the next level. Uh, Tom Brady beats Alabama in the Sugar Bowl, then gets benched for the first half of the next season, doesn't transfer, doesn't whine. He goes out and he he beats out um, – oh, man, what's that guy's name? Drew – Drew was it Brian Greasy? Hey, yeah. Whatever it was, they 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 got a uh, a five star to come in. They started him over Tom Brady. He didn't complain. He went out there and halfway through the season, he beat him out again and held on to it. Yeah, and I always thought that was funny because that that quarterback he was often a commentator down the road for a lot of Brady's professional games. Yeah, it, that is that is kind of ironic. But you know, this is I think this is a good defining moment for Caleb Williams, who does he has all the talent in the world. And when you see him out on the field, I mean, he work, he works really hard and he's tough, but he, there's a lot of questions about his character right now, and this is a great chance for him to answer them, and I hope in a positive way. Yeah, I hope so. I hope, I hope he plays. I hope so, too. And, Joe, I wanted to mention one more thing about the Harbaugh story that I found interesting. It was pointed out to me earlier that the one game last year where they wouldn't have been able to – have sent their guy out to steal signs in advance of the game was the TCU game they lost. And then, of course, the year before that, the Georgia game. Uh, of course, they lost to Michigan State during the regular season two years ago. But I thought it was funny. I watched an interview with Kirby Smart where they asked, like, you know, did you notice them stealing any signs from you during the game? And he was like, I don't know. The game didn't really dictate where I would have even noticed that. AKA, we beat them so bad. How would I even notice they would have done that against us? I thought it was kind of funny. Like, you know, it, it, it's funny. Like, there's two parts today. It's, it's, it's a funny line in that moment. And it's also so true, too. Like, think about, you know, any game where it's a lopsided score, we never scrutinize the officials and we never really like study the what is. No, and here's another thing, too. Another reason I don't care about that hardball story. That is the exact reason I don't care about it. Because even if this is true and this is giving him an edge over Big Ten opponents, guess what? He's never going to win a national championship if his team is not actually better than the other teams they're playing. And last year they weren't better than TCU, and they certainly weren't better than Georgia two years ago, and they lost both of those games. So it didn't matter anyway. Right. You know that that's true. Like you know they're they're they're, um, they're not winning the championship, and that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, maybe even before the show, like kind of the difference between how I view this and the Houston Astros scandal. Like, they won a World Series, and so I feel like that's what maybe people found more appalling about that. Absolutely. Well, Joe, speaking of Michigan, that leads me to my lock of the week. And one of the things that I've done all season, I've been high on the UNC Tar Heels, and they didn't inform me until last week. I've also faded Michigan State really bad. Ever since the Mel Tucker story came out, and, of course, uh, they placed them – uh, on administrative leave and fired him, I really knew that this was going to destroy the Michigan State locker room because of everything that university has been through, the stain they already have and stories that kind of like fall within this vein right here, uh, the Larry Nasser stories, and then you, you think about the the bad shooting they had on campus, and you add that in with with these horrible allegations about Mel Tucker – I knew the players weren't going to play very good, and they've been getting killed ever since the story came out. Well, I saw a line this week that I couldn't believe. Uh, Minnesota is fresh off a huge upset victory over Iowa. I know it was a low-scoring game. It was 12-10, to 10, but that's what you get when you play Iowa. Michigan State has lost to everybody, I think, this season uh, since this came out of any worth by like 17-plus points. Minnesota is a very well-coached team. They tend to beat the teams they're supposed to ever since P.J. Fleck has been there. They're favored by seven points in this game, and I think getting a win over Iowa in Iowa City uh, in front of the Wave and Kennard Field last week, this this Minnesota team I think is picking up, and this right now this Big Ten West is wide open. They're a team that has a chance, especially after that big win, to be a factor in it. 
And I look for the Gophers to roll on this and really just continue what is going to be a historically bad season for Michigan State football. I think so. Like, it's one of those things where what was it a few years ago when the Jacksonville Jaguars were struggling offensively and everybody in fantasy football said, you know, I'm just going to take the defense of whoever's playing the uh, Jaguars, you know, when they match up. That's kind of the way it is, unfortunately, with Michigan State. Like, whoever they're playing, you probably want to give their opponent the advantage. Yeah, I mean, I think that right now, the rest of the season, if you bet against Michigan State every time, you're going to win at least two-thirds of them. And I think right now, if this line was something like 10 and a half, I would maybe say don't do it. But at seven, especially if you can get it down to a hook at six and a, six and a half, I think Minnesota's a great bet. And they'll probably beat them in a, in a, in a low-scoring game. It'll probably be something like 17 to seven. But I think you're good at seven points. Yeah, I'm really shocked it's this close. Like, you know, I know that Minnesota's different than Michigan. I mean, Michigan ran them, you know, out of the, you know, the building 49 to nothing. Like, it's not like this was some type of inspiring, you know, 42 to 28 effort. Right, and that was one that I thought last week, I was like, if Michigan State is ever going to push anybody the rest of the season, it's going to be Michigan. That's a team that they always play up for. It's a rivalry game. And even in this one, in the midst of, you know, these this sign-stealing scandal against Harbaugh and Michigan, um, them playing the rival, they got beat 49-0. nothing. This is a team that's not going to get up for anybody the rest of the year. I think they've shown that. No, no, not, not at all. So, go Gophers and fade Sparty. <laughs> all right, Joe, what do you have? Um, were we also looking at, like, the under for um, Mississippi State Alder? Yes, uh, you know, Joe, I, I think the one that you're going with is going to be the under for Auburn and Mississippi State. Yeah, like what What was it the last time we talked about it? Was it 40-something for the over-under? So right now it's 43-and-a-half for Auburn and Mississippi State, and you're coming off a game where Mississippi State, I will say in a victory, they beat Arkansas 7-3 to and a historically woeful Auburn offense that – is averaging barely more than not 200, not 300, 100 yards passing in SEC play. And they just – they can't throw the ball. They've got a good – they've got a good running backs, you know, and Jarquez Hunter and Brian Batty and, and Olsen. But right now, I mean, they just they, – they are struggling so much to throw the ball and it's making their offense extremely anemic. But they have a great defense, just like Mississippi State does. And – Joe, I, I mean, at 43 and a half, I think this game is a steal. I mean, this is one that – this is going to be eye-bleed football that the Iowa Hawkeyes, Hawkeyes would be proud of in this game. Yeah, I mean, this is the type of game where I feel like either team, if they get to the 20s, you know, you're kind of shocked. I feel like it's a much better chance of being, like, in the teens and maybe even kind of a weird game on top of that. You know, maybe a game where each team has a safety or has to settle for some field goals, like – Maybe look for like a weird score, like 19 to 17 or something like that, or, you know, 16 to 12. Just just something odd about about this game. And it's just so drastically different for State, you know, with how their offense was so high flying the last three years. And then I, I don't think I've ever seen an offense, you know, obviously you don't have Mike Leach, unfortunately, anymore, but I don't think I've ever seen an offense on any level look so drastically different the next season. I mean, just completely flip the script from a team that's, you know, putting up in the 30s every week. Their defense is giving up a lot, you know, exciting kind of games. I mean, shoot, that Auburn, uh, Auburn-Mississippi State game last year was one of the more exciting games of the season. Went into double overtime, points all over the place. Um, and now, Jim, I find it extremely ironic that 15 years ago was the infamous Auburn 3-Mississippi State 2 game where I was a, I was a sophomore at Auburn. And I remember watching that game and, like, yelling, being like, this is baseball, this is not football. I was so angry watching it because it was just like – it was bad football. I mean, it really was I bleed football. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, those offenses for Auburn and Mississippi State might be better than what I'm seeing right now. Um, yeah, if the this question is, Dan, when State and Auburn play in baseball in the spring, like, are they going to score more points than in this game? I would say yes right now. Uh, Joe, I, I'm, I'm putting my joke prediction out here for this game is Auburn wins two to nothing on a safety. <laughs> I mean, that, that that would be fitting. I mean, who knows what's going to happen with the game? 
you know, for either team, it's it's a win that you kind of have to have to kind of get your season going and kind of salvage things a little bit. Um, but, you know, one more thing I want to say about Mississippi State, uh, just my frustration with how the offense is run. Again, I know there's a coaching change. I know there's different personnel. But to me, what they've done this year with this offense is just so unfortunate. To me, it'd be the equivalent, Dan, <coughs> of having, like, a team in basketball where you've got, like, uh, mostly guards, and all of a sudden you're trying to, like, play a defensive and rebounding style of basketball. If you're trying to do something where you don't really have the personnel to run it the way you should. And so, to me, it's almost been self-destructive. Or, or you have a game, you know, a team that you're full with, like, LeBrons and Giannis's and, you know, big guys, and you try to shoot threes all the time. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that too. Um. Joe, you know, I've been I was talking about in the last show about how Hugh Freeze has been, you know, considering this season a wash and doing mostly recruiting. Well, this is a perfect opportunity for him. At the end of this game, he needs to go over and just talk to Will Rogers and be like, hey, what are you doing next season? Yeah, I mean, that that's I'm fascinated to see where he is next year. That that would be a great fit. So yeah, I would I would like to see that happen. I mean, seriously, like he he's on the recruiting trail. You're gonna have a really good quarterback that is quite upset where he is right now, that's right there. I mean, that's exactly what Lincoln Riley in Oklahoma did with Jalen Hurts after they got killed by Alabama in the next season they brought him in. I mean, this is a great opportunity. Like, seriously, he needs to go talk to Will, Will Clark. I mean, to he needs to go talk to Will Rogers after that game's on. Uh, I mean, that, that's fascinating. I had not thought about it. Um, I was talking to my dad about it last week. We were trying to figure out where Rodgers would go next year. And I kept thinking for some reason somewhere in the Big 12, like Texas Tech. But, no, Auburn actually would be a very interesting fit. Yeah, so we'll see. But the uh, point being, 43 and a half, this is about the safest under bet that you'll have all year. I mean, I legitimately think the first team to score 17 probably wins this game. Oh, yeah. Like, if somebody gets to 17, they're in really good shape. Now, they might win 17 to 7 if they get 17 points. And the other team might just kind of, you know, give up a little bit offensively. Like it's kind of, there's a more out factor here, too. Oh, definitely. But it's also a big game because, I mean, you look at it, if Auburn can win this, then they have a chance to, you know, to beat Arkansas and Vanderbilt uh, and then New Mexico State and win seven games in the regular season. Uh, you know, and then they'd have a lot of confidence going into the Iron Bowl. I wouldn't say they'd have much of a chance, but if they win those games, they certainly are in a much better position to have the morale to hang with Alabama than otherwise. And if you're Mississippi State, this is also a must-have if you want to go to a bowl game. So I think this is a huge, a huge game for two first-year coaches that really want to take their teams to a bowl game. Sure, sure. Both of, both of them need it, need it really bad. I, I agree completely. So who do you like in it, Joe? Are you going to take Auburn on the home team, or do you think State gets another win against Auburn? I'll go Auburn because it's at home. I, I think that'll make a big difference. And I, I just, you know, I don't trust either offense, but I, I think that I feel that Auburn has the potential maybe to even score on defense in this game more likely. Oh, definitely. All right, Joe, um, speaking of offenses that, that may struggle a little bit, uh, Georgia, I think, has been better on offense this year than a lot of people were expecting. Uh, now we're going to see their first game without Brock Bowers. They kind of, you know, fuddy duddied around with Vanderbilt a little bit and, and didn't beat them very bad. Florida's been maybe the most Jekyll and Hyde team in all of college football this year. This is a big rivalry game. But, Joe, in my mind, kind of like when everybody started doubting Georgia before Kentucky and they went out and they laid the big dog hammer on on, on Kentucky, I kind of think the same thing's going to happen right here, Joe. I mean, you look at all the talent that Georgia has in the wide receiver room with, uh, with Ladd McConkey. Uh, and you, you go down the list um, uh, with Milton. There's a lot of players they have that are really good at wide receiver. They're starting to get some of their running backs, too, uh, back also. And I kind of think that Carson Beck has really been a lot better than I expect him to be. I mean, he's he's like over a 70% passer right now. He's thrown for over 300 yards in his last, I think, four games. I think that George is going to dominate this. They've got a good chance to. You know, it's typically kind of what they do. You know, they kind of morphed into that Alabama scenario where, you know, you expect them maybe to have a close call every now and then and they'll go out and dominate the team in that quote-unquote test. Um, and I think that Carson Beck kind of falls into that category with the theme of what I was talking about in the first segment with Florida State kind of being that forgotten commodity as an undefeated team. 
I mean, Carson Beck is kind of that forgotten quarterback in college football this year. I mean, before you – when you're listing the names of the best quarterbacks in the country, I mean, do you even think of him before you get to, like, number 12? No, and, and, and you look at his numbers, he's maybe even top five when you look at actual, like, you know, numbers that matter. Yeah, I mean, it is, it, it's so um, deceptive and so surprising that his numbers match up top tier, but the it factor, like, you know, I don't know what it is. Maybe, I guess, just him playing with Georgia, being a machine, you know, we, we don't appreciate it. Absolutely not. And, and here's the deal. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for him to show the wealth of talent they have at the wide receiver room and spread it out a little bit. The bottom line is there's a reason that Jermaine Burton and A.D. Mitchell transferred from Georgia because they got a lot of dudes in the wide receiver room. And Brock Bowers is so good that they've been feeding him the rock, just like what you see with Travis Kelsey with the Chiefs. But now that he's not there, now these other guys have a chance to show out, and I think you're going to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll I'll be interested to see how the offense looks because it's kind of a preview of what the offense will have to look like against Ole Miss. Exactly. And I I think it's really funny now and and ironic that Jermaine Burden transferred to Alabama, uh, didn't really do a whole lot when they had Bryce Young. Now he's starting to pick it up a little bit with Jalen Milrow, but can you imagine what he'd be doing if he had – if you'd say to Georgia and he had Carson Beck thrown to him right now? Yeah, I mean, he'd have a lot of uh, success, especially, you know, with Bowers when he was playing. You know, there'd be a lot of people double-teaming at Bowers and Burton would have a field day. Definitely. Um, but let me say this. Um, I'm also interested to see, if you look at the numbers, Graham Mertz is actually doing a lot better. and he, He's shown out a lot more lately. Um I will say that that win over South Carolina looks a lot less impressive now that South Carolina is really, you know, just like Frank Beamer kicking his leg and breaking it in anger. That's kind of what the South Carolina team has turned into is basically a bumbling football team that's just hurting themselves all over the place. Uh, They look like a good win for Florida when it happened, but now it doesn't look as impressive. Um, You know, Graham Mertz is having better numbers than he showed out to begin with, though. So maybe they'll have a chance to make it somewhat interesting. Yeah, I don't know what Florida is. I feel like week to week my opinion on them changes. I mean, the only thing I know is that they're they're going to lose this game. Oh, they're going to lose. It's just a question of do they do what Auburn did and play over their head and maybe make it a one-score game, or does Georgia go Kentucky on them and beat them like 55-7? Mm-hmm. Do you ever think with this game um, that it would be nice if they could play it on the, at the stadiums? I don't know, Joe. I, I've thought about it. I'm just so used to seeing it as the neutral site, and I like it. You know, I don't know. I mean, but I, I say that, but then again, as an Auburn fan, like one of the best things that ever happened to Auburn football was when they moved the Iron Bowl away from Legion Field in Birmingham and made it a home-and-home. Home. Yeah, I just I think about it a lot anytime I'm watching even OU in Texas or AM Arkansas and especially this game. I think to myself, you know, this is cool, this is a novelty, but I would I would like to see it on the campuses. Well, I know Kirby Smart's been pressing for that, and you may see it. I mean, both Georgia and Florida have really unique home atmospheres. Right, absolutely. Uh Joe, speaking of unique home atmospheres, probably the two best that we have in the Pac-12 right now are Oregon and Utah, and they're taking on each other. Utah coming fresh off that really great, uh, you know, no, yet another win against USC that ended their national title hopes. Uh, Oregon, meanwhile, they had a they had a bye after losing to Washington in that really tightly contested game. Um, you know, Utah, it seems like they're going to be playing without uh, Cam Rising for the rest of the season, it looks like. This is a really interesting game to me. I think Oregon's a much better team than them. Uh, but Utah just keeps getting it done with their backup quarterbacks. Uh, this is going to be a fascinating one for me. I mean, I'm leaning Oregon, but I'm not going to be shocked if Utah somehow wins. Yeah, for me um, – I think Utah has a great chance, but I think it's going to be hard for them coming back from the emotional win against USC, 34-32. I think that where this game fits on the schedule is just bad timing, in addition to, I think, just trusting the quarterback with Bo Nix more in this matchup. So I, I think Oregon wins, but, I, you know, it'll be a tough battle. Yeah, I think so. Now I'll say this. If Utah had had them last week instead of USC, I think there would have been a much better chance that they won. I think that would have been – Really hard for Oregon to get up off the mat the very next week taking on this team. But giving them a week to rest, 
get their mind right. I got to think that Oregon, with what I think is superior talent across the board, is going to get the get the W on this one. Right, and Oregon, I mean, he still has lots to play for. You know, Washington could slip up, and they they could have a great opportunity. You know, at the end of the day. Well, I still think Oregon, if they were to win out and beat a Washington or even a USC uh, in the Pac-12 championship game, would make the college football playoff, I think. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still right there. Absolutely. Um, Joe, another interesting one in this ACC that now it looks like, you know, Florida State is the only chance they have for the CFB, but there still is a lot of th- moving parts as to who's going to be the team that takes plays them. Duke takes on Louisville. And you and I were talking about this a little bit last show. I kind of wish that, you know, they would have sat Riley Leonard in a game they probably couldn't have won against Florida State. And this one that is a huge one as to who's going to be the second place team that gets to take on Florida State in a Duke versus Louisville matchup. Louisville, of course, got off that huge hot start, was undefeated, just beat down Notre Dame in a really embarrassing loss for the Fighting Irish. And then they follow it the next week with just getting drilled by Pitt. And, you know, probably my worst lock of the week was saying to to take Louisville on the points against Pitt. Um, this is a fascinating game right here. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and I can't help but think that Louisville will win because I think that, like you said, um, Dukes, by playing Leonard in the way that ended, I think that this allows them to unfortunately lose game, two games in a row. Um, you know, with losing to Florida State, it kind of morphs into – Unfortunately, another loss, and I think that um, Louisville is probably playing better football right now, and I just can't say enough about the job that Brahm has done in his first year at Louisville. Yeah, I, I did not expect this type of impact this fast. You know, Brahm has been incredible in his first season. and I, I mean, right now I think he's a shoe-in for National Coach of the Year. Yeah, I mean, he's had an impact. You know, it's not quite to that level, but, like, it reminds me a little bit of what Mike Elko did Last year at Duke, you know, obviously Duke was expected to be horrific last year, but, you know, Brom has had, you know, an impact on some level that resembles that type of turnaround. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not quite what Gus Malzahn did in his first year at Auburn, but it's the next tier of a turnaround right now. Yes. Um, I think it's going to be between him and Eli Drinkwitz right now for a coach of the year nationally. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Um. You know, especially after their huge win that they had, 33-12 to 12 over South Carolina. What an impressive win from Missouri. Um, Joe, uh, a game, you know, we talked about how there, there's weird games that don't work out well. Like when, when Tennessee goes to Florida, bad things happen. Weirdly, Ole Miss and Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt has been way more competitive against Ole Miss than they have pretty much anybody else. And they beat Ole Miss a lot more than you think they should. Uh you know, I'm not making this a lock of the week, but I saw a line where they favored Ole Miss by 24 and a half against Vanderbilt. And I know that Vanderbilt is woeful, but man, do I not think this is going to be a close game, weirdly. It just gives me a weird vibe to it. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, the only chance I see Vanderbilt has of covering is because I can see Ole Miss kind of not wanting to, um, you know, maybe show all their cards in this game, kind of using this as – a quote-unquote bye week between mm-hmm. Auburn and A&M to get rested a little bit. Maybe they, they don't play as hard in the second half. So maybe that's the only chance you have. But see no stratosphere where Vanderbilt has a chance to win this game. Oh, none um, to win the game. But I think they could keep it a lot closer than that. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. I agree. And you're right. There's been a lot of weird um, aspects in this rivalry over the years. And, you know, this is a rivalry that will, of course, not be played every year after this season. So that, that, that will come to an end for uh, those of you out there who, you know, really uh, were inspired by the Ole Miss Vanderbilt robbery. <laughs> you, you know, there's, there's upsetting ones, Joe, Auburn losing LSU every year off the, off the calendar. That's an upsetting one. I think it's been a really highly contested rivalry that's going to, you know, really upset some people. Uh, if Alabama loses LSU, that's going to, that's going to rub some people the wrong way. Uh if Auburn and Georgia ultimately goes away, that's a rough one. Uh, if Florida and LSU goes away. But for some reason, I don't think people are going to care as much about if Ole Miss and Vanderbilt goes away. It does have a Wikipedia page, that rivalry for Ole Miss. <laughs> What's the name of that rivalry? I don't even know. Does it have a name? I don't think it has a name. I think it's just the Ole Miss-Vanderbilt football rivalry. 
<laughs> they need to come up with one like that. I don't, I don't even know what it, what, what you would call it. There should uh, be a. the the anchor rub anchor rub rivalry. Yeah, I was trying to think. The only thing I could think of, yeah, anchor rib. For some reason, what's that? That Batman Tower in Nashville, like the Batman Bowl or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what I was thinking is you could get a trophy where you had Colonel Reb's hat on top of the anchor. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, I think that would be a good trophy for that game. Um, but yes, I think in terms of the SEC rivalries that that may disappear with the conference realignment, I don't think that one's going to be one that's, that people are going to miss that much. We well, you know, lastly, what was it like? Fins up, everybody used to say at Ole Miss, and it's anchor down. Like you kind of got it up down a little you know, play on there too. Yeah, that's true. Or maybe you could do uh, an anchor with a shark jumping through the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. That could be good. Like, kind of like, like this little, little Miami Dolphin logo to an extent. We're probably the only ones that, you know, really give that much uh, of an assessment to that, into that robbery. I don't think any of these schools have even thought about what you and I are talking about, Joe. <laughs> um, Joe, speaking of, speaking of a game that, that that's kind of funny that, Probably doesn't matter nationally, but really is going to matter to the fan bases. Um, Kentucky and Tennessee, this is going to be an interesting get-off-the-mat game. Both of these teams have really just been crushed by what's happened lately. Uh, You know, Tennessee looks so good against A&M defensively. They looked so great in the first half against Alabama. and And then Kentucky, of course, everyone's like, oh, man, look how good Kentucky is. They get drilled by Georgia. Then they get beat pretty badly by Missouri. These teams still technically are in the SEC East race. Now they're on life support, but they both still haven't played Georgia yet. And this is the game that determines whether they even have the smallest chance if for some reason Georgia would stumble to uh to Ole Miss to make that to make the SEC championship game. I guess Kentucky's probably doomed no matter what. Really, for Tennessee, this is it's Tennessee's last chance that they have to resurrect uh, what has been a disappointing season so far. I don't know what will happen in this game. Um, isn't it at Kentucky or is it at Tennessee? I think it's at Kentucky. Wow. Um, I mean, there's a part of me that could see Tennessee coming out there and looking really impressive and frustrating their fans, you know, the way last week went with missed opportunity, but – there's also a part of me, I feel like the greater chance, Dan, is for Tennessee to not be over that loss and being on the road, Kentucky being able to, you know, maybe get some momentum early, and maybe Kentucky caring a little bit more about this game. So I think I'll give the edge to Kentucky at home. Joe, I would like to go with Kentucky, but from a matchup standpoint, I think Tennessee's a very bad matchup for them. Uh, Tennessee has the number one rush defense in the SEC. Uh, Kentucky, that's all they can do is run the football. I kind of look for the same thing that, like, you know, when people were looking at Kentucky as, you know, having a chance against Georgia, the things that Kentucky is good at don't match up with the same things that, that you know, that Georgia is good at and that Tennessee is good at. So I think that this is probably a game that the matchups don't work very well for Kentucky because I just don't think they're going to be able to run the ball as well on a really stout defensive front for Tennessee. That You look at it, even held Alabama and Texas A&M down, who are both more rushing football teams. So I, I think that Tennessee is not going to play very great. I'm not feeling fantastic about this, but I got to give the edge to Tennessee based on their defense and especially their run defense. I can see that. I mean, that, that's a good, you know, analysis of the matchup. And, you know, Tennessee, like I said, you know, they could look impressive in this game. You know, maybe they give Georgia a game later in the season. And I will say that, you know, they showed last year, I think, a track record of being able, you know, to win some impressive matchups. And maybe, you know, some of the experience from winning an Orange Bowl, maybe this is a game where that kind of shows up. Absolutely. And if you look at last year, I mean, they destroyed Kentucky last year. So I just think that this is probably a poor matchup for them. But we shall see. And we'll also see you next week. Uh, thank you for listening. Check out the Lord of Says on Spotify. And, of course, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Jeff.